Dear Gibraltar, I would like to start this address by thanking each and every one of you for the support and understanding you have shown me in these difficult days. Despite some cowardly accusations coming from certain toxic quarters, me and my family have been consoled by the warm embrace of this generous and loving community, and we will be forever grateful. I also want you all to know that we have been working hard outside of Parliament to provide you with our own take on the state of the nation and to do so in a way that cuts through the spin and the protocol and gives you an honest, straightforward and in-depth analysis of Gibraltar's current predicament and how we should get out of it. Much has been discussed about the adequacy and viability of the figures in this budget about the responsibility, or lack of, displayed by the government in using the resources of this community. Unfortunately, I believe the problem is far more profound than whether this is the right budget for Gibraltar or not. It has become clear to most of us right now that this government simply cannot be trusted. By the same token, we cannot trust this budget or the vast majority of figures that it includes. Because if you can hide public debt in government-owned companies, you can hide other expenses too. If you claim to have rainy day funds and do not spend them in the rainiest day of our history, your claims make no sense. If you introduce measures to increase revenue, yet still present budget cuts in the most vital and downtrodden of all public services, our GHA, your policies make no sense. If you introduce tax measures for companies designed to salvage desperate public finances, only to then remove them hours later, your motives make no sense. If you introduce strange nuances to justify discrepancies in the figures presented by different members of your government, your arguments make no sense. When so many things don't make sense, the explanation is normally very simple we are not being given the full picture. All these reasons mean we cannot trust the figures in this budget. It would therefore be wise for all MPs and citizens of Gibraltar to assume that, like in issues surrounding public debt, things are going to be much tougher than projected in these estimates. We must all prepare for the difficult times ahead of us. On public debt, we must guide ourselves by the figures we have and even by those most likely sanitized parameters, our predicament is extremely worrying. Firstly, we are in enormous levels of debt. We do not know exactly how much debt, an already intolerable fact, but many estimate that public debt is somewhere in between one and a half and two billion pounds. To have an idea of how much debt is too much debt, there are some studies we can look into. The World Bank establishes a threshold of 77% public debt to GDP ratio. If debt is above this threshold, things begin to spiral. Debt starts to become a drain on annual growth, costing more to service than can be comfortably generated to pay back. This undermines the confidence of markets in the capacity of nations to pay their debts, bringing the cost of borrowing up even more. And so the spiral begins. In small economies like Gibraltar, without the backing of powerful central banks, this threshold is presumed to be much lower. Even though we don't know for sure, everything points to the fact that we have crossed that threshold and that public debt is spiraling out of control. How? Well, in this last year, with our public finances already overstretched from mismanagement and the cost of the pandemic, the government spent 100 million pounds more than had been budgeted. When you have no money, lots of debt, and you still manage to spend more than you earn, there is only one way to describe the situation, out of control. The implications of this are quite simple though. The more we owe, the more we need to pay back. 
the more interest we will pay if we need to borrow in the future, the less independent we will be in our economic and political affairs, and crucially, the less we will have to spend on our healthcare, education and public sector. That is, of course, if we manage to pay it back. If we don't, we would enter a process of default, which would see us going cap in hand to the motherland to ask for a bailout. This would be a national humiliation, which would decimate our reputation and destroy our private economy, with most investors rushing out to greener, safer pastures. And you might think, she's just exaggerating. She's trying to gain political points. And of course she would. She's an opposition MP. But before you do, remember this. We are already well on this path. In the years since the pandemic, we have been able to borrow at an affordable rate only because the UK granted us the privilege of backing 500 million pounds of debt with their economy. They stepped in to help us because they knew, or we told them, that we would not be able to borrow otherwise. We were already on the verge of collapse. As for tanking our reputation, we have already seen this government allow us to be grey-listed by the Financial Action Task Force. This has meant that as a result, the UK has included us in their list of high-risk third countries. This decision will inevitably have enormous negative effects for our financial sector and could have been avoided with a real, adequately funded commitment to rules, enforcement and transparency throughout the sector. The Moneyval report, which was spun to be a success, set out the roadmap clearly. The government simply did not do enough to stop this. To now hide behind the regulators and conspiracy theories is nothing but another attempt to spin their way out of their incompetence, or their dishonesty, or both. Now that people understand the state of our public finances, it is important that the community understand where we are right now and who is at the helm of our affairs. Gibraltar is heading to a precipice and we are in the hands of a dangerous government which will do anything to hold on to power. With a perfect storm of budget deficits, spiralling public debt, rampant inflation, grey listing by the FATF and the introduction on the UK list of high-risk third countries, an impending recession and the growing threat of a no-deal Brexit, there is a real and present danger that the Gibraltar economy will collapse. And while I hate to be the bearer of such disastrous news, it is important that we stare at this reality in the face and take the right steps to stop this collapse. Notwithstanding the criticisms I have made about the credibility of this budget, I believe I have to give a measure of credit to the government for the revenue-raising measures they have implemented in this budget. While imperfect, many of these go in the right direction, even to the point of challenging some of the economic myths that Mr. Picardo and his cronies have fought so hard to create. For the Chief Minister to backtrack so dramatically on his recent rhetoric is a courageous thing to do, and I commend him for it. He has broken away from an income tax system that was extremely unfair and seemed set in stone. He has had the cheek, though, to refer to it as the GSD taxation system when he has maintained it for over a decade and protected it tooth and nail whenever questioned until we reach the precipice of bankruptcy. He has even gone as far as to talk about social justice in taxation, a term which I assume he has taken out directly from my blog, which I know has many avid readers in the Picardo sphere. From there, he has also taken heed of our suggestion to tax the highest earners in our community in this time of need. He has proposed, as we did, a sort of post-pandemic consensus in which we all chip in according to the old Marxist saying, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. 
Unfortunately, not all the measures proposed are proportional and progressive, as suggested by socialist maxims, or by the Chief Minister himself in his appeal to social justice. Tax hikes to the highest earners are significant, yet they have also been coupled with smaller hikes for lower earners. The measures for companies, which he is already backtracking on, are extremely unfair on small businesses who are already suffering the effects of high inflation and negative consumer trends. I reiterate my request to introduce only progressive measures, taxing more to those who can afford to contribute the most and protecting the needy in our community. Care must also be placed to spare small businesses and the middle classes as much as possible, even though this chief minister does well to remind the Gibraltarians that fiscal pressure in Gibraltar is still considerably lower than in the vast majority of comparable Western democracies. Unfortunately, he failed to remind us that the social safety net for the private sector is not comparable to these other countries either, with workers in the private sector still enjoying a regime more akin to developing nations than to our European counterparts. This is a glaring injustice that as soon as economic prospects allow should be addressed by our government with courage and determination. I also have to express my disappointment in the opposition's arguments against this budget. While we agree that there has been costly mismanagement of our public affairs and lavish spending, as they like to put it, while we agree that vanity projects like VIP festivals and luxury travel arrangements are both morally and economically reprehensible, while we agree that there are inefficiencies in our civil service that need urgent address, it is disingenuous to pretend that just with a bit of GSD-style prudent management of our affairs, we can solve all our problems. Even if he is ultimately responsible for where we are financially, the Chief Minister is right to say that the alternative to raising revenue is cutting costs. And that would deepen the crisis and deprive a generation of Gibraltarians of basic public services. The GSD need to do some serious introspection and explain how they find themselves so often on the populist side of the debate. On taxes, on the rights of the unvaccinated, on frontier workers' rights. I would like to, yet again, ask the Leader of the Opposition, how exactly does one use cross-frontier workers as bargaining chips? Do we threaten not to let them in? Do we show our muscle by depriving our businesses of their workforce, our hospital of doctors and nurses, and our elderly homes of carers? How much of a persuasive argument does he think we can make by shooting ourselves on both feet? The Leader of the Opposition must understand that guaranteeing the rights of cross-frontier workers is as much a success for Gibraltar as it is for Spain, but he believes that making the argument will favour his political interests. That is not the way to provide the political alternative that Gibraltar desperately needs. Gibraltar has suffered enough spin and manipulation at the hands of this government, and the parties in opposition need to rise up to a moment that demands brutal honesty and complete transparency. It is also equally and extremely worrying that a member of the opposition would even hint at overturning a referendum celebrated only a handful of months ago, in a position that can only be described as Christo-fascist. If Keith Asopardi wants to convince the Gibraltarian electorate that he can guide Gibraltar through these difficult times, he must first prove that he can persuade his own party to pursue the progressive values he claims to espouse. As opposition, it's our job to criticize what is wrong, but also to give credit where credit is due. To raise taxes to those who can afford it is the right thing right now in a low tax jurisdiction like Gibraltar, because the opposite would mean austerity, degraded public services, and an even greater downward economic spiral. We hope 
this moment of reckoning is used to reflect profoundly about the many systemic issues our economy faces and to create a tax system that finds a fair and efficient balance between drawing inward investment and the Chief Minister's newfound appreciation of social justice. If we go back to business as usual in two years, I am certain that sooner or later we will find ourselves at the gates of doom again. Let's use this opportunity to make profound reforms that can guarantee the long-term sustainability of our economy and public finances. Let's build a better economic model that creates more value and breaks away from some of our old habits. Let us make our civil service more modern and efficient, demanding it provides a stronger backbone for our private sector. Let's do this while guaranteeing quality public employment, which is an absolutely necessary tool at a time in which workers' rights are being constantly degraded by economic competition. I am not saying that these are easy endeavors, but they are worthwhile ones, and I am convinced they can be carried out by sourcing the right expertise and having the political courage to look to the future and not the past. I sincerely hope that these measures have the desired impact and that they bring an end to the austerity that is already happening in many of our vital public services. However, it beggars belief that while the system is still dealing with the medical aftermath of the pandemic, we are still seeing cuts affecting staff, equipment and consumables in the GHA. Six months into the Minister for Health announcing landmark reforms, the state of our healthcare continues to deteriorate. Any reboot of a flailing healthcare system needs to be urgent and adequately funded if it is to succeed. But this year, the GHA has received yet another devastating budget cut that will further erode the quality of our healthcare, the morale of our workers, and will leave many in this community feeling vulnerable and desperate. How on earth are we supposed to fix the mounting problems in the GHA with a reduction in spending to the tune of £40 million? Where is the impact of the revenue-raising measures brought in by the government? People with healthcare issues cannot be expected to wait for months on end to receive adequate support, and it is wholly unrealistic to expect healthcare professionals to fix this emergency with shrinking resources. The most prominent issue is that of getting an appointment to see a GP in a timely manner, if at all. In April, we were told that key alterations have been made to the GHA's telephone systems and that the public could expect changes in the coming weeks to the way in which they interact with the primary care centre appointment line. This is not the experience of hundreds of Gibraltarians who continue to wrestle with the appointment system, nor is it what was expressed at the recent GHA board presentation, where insufficient, lacklustre reforms were promised in the future. The shortfalls of the telephone system means that people in need of primary attention are being directed to A&E by the PCC reception when people cannot get an appointment. As a result, the GHA have pointed out that 47% of A&E attendants are not urgent and has been calling for responsible use of emergency services. It is clear that a substantial proportion of this 47% are citizens who have been let down by an inadequately resourced primary care response and that the problems cannot be fixed solely by shaming the public for using A&E unnecessarily. We need a functioning appointment system and sufficient resources in primary care in order to stop desperate patients seeking any form of medical attention from turning up at A&E. The landmark reforms mentioned a review of theatres and surgical waiting lists, the result of which is yet to be seen. Waiting times for A&E and GP appointments continue to be problematic, while waiting lists to access specialist care, elective surgeries 
outpatient appointments and medical investigations are at an all-time high, with delays from the pandemic still putting extra stress on all services. Reports from within indicate that staffing levels throughout departments are insufficient, with burnout increasing. Surgical wards are completely full, with low levels of permanent staff nurses being filled by agency nursing. Meanwhile, we have new, important top-tier positions within the GHA making enormous salaries, often acting like PR agents for the Ministry. Staff is exhausted and morale is low, and we still have a long way to go before economic prospects improve. We need to levy resources for our healthcare and we need to, like most other Western nations have done, increase spending on healthcare until the GHA gets back on track. To do it before will only make the problem snowball and will come at the dramatic cost of preventable deaths and suffering. Maybe they see the new Zanet health facility and a move towards private healthcare as a solution to the problems of our GHA. I wonder who would benefit from that. Experience shows us that it certainly won't be the general public. I'm sure the people of this community will step up to the occasion and chip in to help Gibraltar in its time of need. We have always huddled together when we have faced national challenges. All we ask is that the government stop lying to us. Stop the spin, stop the bullying of dissidents, stop peddling the absurd narrative that everything the government does is a success and everything the opposition says is ludicrous. The government's request that the community contribute decisively to get us out of economic trouble should be coupled with a commitment to usher in a new era of honesty, transparency and accountability. Fabian Picardo and his government have to start taking responsibility for their mistakes, their oversights and their active and willful wrongdoings. And accountability starts at home with political responsibility from the Chief Minister and his ministers. If you have done a bad job, have some decency and political integrity and go home. Let someone else with ideas and integrity take on the job. Stop treating ministries like your political party's little employment office and start recruiting ministers based on knowledge and expertise. Stop rewarding ridiculous sycophants that distort the political debate pretending to be independents. Stop using the resources of the state to run a propaganda machine. Stop funding rags that attack civil society and respect the people who run NGOs and give of their time to help others. Stop putting vital public services in the hands of incompetent ministers who insist on running departments they do not understand. Stop pretending you want to fight corruption when your crony capitalist machine is operating at full steam. And for God's sakes, tell your speechwriters to do a bit of research on your literary references before you make a fool of yourself in the biggest event of our democracy. In recent years, Kipling's reputation has taken such a beating that it's a wonder any sensible politician would want to go near him now. Kipling has been variously labelled as a colonialist, a jingoist, a racist, an anti-Semite, a misogynist, a right-wing imperialist warmonger, all with considerable substance. A bit of advice, Mr. Picardo. Make sure your advisors don't set you down these embarrassing paths. Another thing that we have been doing ardently at Together Gibraltar is doing our bit to protect the Brexit negotiations from attempts at populist point scoring. And this is something that we are committed to continue doing until this process is over. We have criticized government in the past for creating a toxic ultra-nationalist narrative around our relationship with Spain and, to a lesser extent, the EU. 
We believe this narrative, designed to emotionally manipulate the electorate, will make it difficult to sell any kind of deal, if we are ever to arrive at one. The government has now dramatically changed its tune regarding Spain and the EU over the last year, but it would do well to revisit some of its past manipulative rhetoric if it is to undo some of the prejudices it has planted in the minds of many. I believe Gibraltar has to be savvy about the situation we are in and understand that the vast majority of the people who have peddled these aggressive narratives have never had any issues with having close ties to Spain, often jetting off to their mansions up the coast after taking part in nationalist rallies. Gibraltar has to understand that a Brexit treaty is absolutely necessary for Gibraltar right now and we need to have the confidence that this government is not going to trade an ounce of our sovereignty. Despite my fraught relationship with the Chief Minister, I have full confidence that despite the cynicism he has deployed in the past, he will not sell us to the Spanish as some deluded nationalists out there will have you believe. I am 100% sure that the GST also know that Gibraltarian sovereignty is not a currency that any government would be willing to commerce with. This issue is too important for populism, too transcendental for cheap manipulation. We need to support our government at this crucial time, have a realistic understanding of the position we are in, explain to the electorate the implications of a no deal, and then have an open, honest debate about the pros and cons of whatever deal eventually comes our way. No heroes, no villains, no martyrs. Only careful, sensible pragmatism in a spirit of good faith and solidarity. Government should start this process of honest analysis and pedagogy now, not to try and use their usual PR tactics to steamroll a deal when it is ready. We believe Gibraltar will make the right decision if treated responsibly and maturely, but we are concerned about the prospect of social unrest if this massive change is perceived to be imposed without discussion. We wish the Chief Minister and his team of negotiators the very best of luck for the coming weeks and months, and we ask that the community continue to view the possibility of a better new relationship with the EU with faith and optimism. I would like to conclude by taking you back to the moment of reckoning I described earlier. You are back in that car that is heading straight for the precipice. On the wheel is someone who tells us he is the only person capable of driving this vehicle, while we see the cliff edge getting closer and closer. His lack of judgment, as well as his unbreakable ties to lobbies and interests, make him completely incapable of lifting his foot off the accelerator. He tells the people he has prepared alternative solutions, jetpacks and wings that will pop out of the doors and wheels of the vehicle that will guarantee us a safe landing. But everybody knows he's lying. He controls every statistic, every figure, he manipulates those who try to scrutinize his work. He punishes those who speak out against him. There is little to no independent oversight of what he does, and he uses this control cunningly to ensure his survival. That is the real reason why this government has to go. It is also the reason why the accounts presented could have been cooked beyond recognition, making all of these observations completely irrelevant. The problem is as much an issue of prudence as it is an issue of chronic dishonesty, and of course, the systemic problems derived from an economic model that is creaking at the seams. This government did not handle our economy prudently. That much is true. It is also true that this government has presided over an enormous increase in public spending to the benefit of many in this community. We have new schools, new infrastructure, new affordable housing, more grants for our students. A lot of the careless spending many refer to has been poured into the welfare of our community and that is something we must recognize. Dishonesty 
because Fabian Picardo and his, as he himself described them in his response, merry men cannot be trusted. They have consistently lied about Gibraltar's affairs from the time they were in opposition and throughout their tenure in government. In the bad times, of course, but also in the good. In doing so, they have brought Gibraltar's public finances to its knees and they are now eroding our public services to intolerable levels. Winds of privatization are sweeping across departments and it has become almost impossible for our youth to find stable, good quality jobs. And the systemic issues is what they now describe as the GSD taxation system, a system dependent on attracting high net worth individuals too often with questionable ties, selling them luxury homes and tax avoidance schemes and turning Gibraltar into a noisy, stressful and polluted concrete jungle. A system that, until this year's welcome glimpse of social justice, has been permanently favouring a privileged elite. They have done so ignoring that this system limits our possibilities and does not allow us to transform our economy into something that can face a future with confidence and optimism. They have tied us to tobacco, fossil fuel, bunkering and tax avoidance and they have not spent the proceeds of these questionable but very lucrative industries to create new sustainable pillars for our economy and better opportunities for our private sector. Now, in the midst of a global move to more financial transparency, sanctions to Russian oligarchs, negotiations with the EU and the threats of a climate crisis, we face enormous pressures to transform our economy. Unfortunately, we no longer have the money to do so. We believe Gibraltar needs real, profound, long-term reforms to address these issues and we will make our ideas on how to do this available to the public in the coming months. We believe this is a path that will take several years, probably decades, but it has to start now. In the meantime, we cannot support this budget as it would represent an endorsement of the dishonest practices of this government. We believe the convention of voting to protect the salaries of public workers was destroyed some years ago by a government whose accounts simply cannot be trusted. Thank you very much for watching this broadcast and we wish you a very happy and peaceful summer.